Hello and welcome to another Learning in 10 review. My name is Michael Boniface and I am a resident physician in emergency medicine at Duke University Hospital in Durham, North Carolina. Today, we are going to talk about Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever. And today's learning objectives are to identify the causative organism for Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, appreciate its life cycle and vectors, discuss both the epidemiology and clinical presentations, Consider the differential diagnosis, and then identify the gold standard for diagnosis and treatment of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. Let's discuss the epidemiology of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. This is an illness that was initially, as the name would suggest, described in the Rocky Mountain region of the United States. That is, in the northwest around Montana and Idaho. However, more recently, the disease has settled around the southeastern portion of the country, with North Carolina and Oklahoma being its highest incidence, accounting for over one-third of all reported cases. Please note, too, on the graph on the right, there is a bell-shaped temporal distribution of reported cases centered around the warmest summer months. This corresponds to the life cycle of the natural vector in Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which we will discuss later. In fact, 95% of all cases of RMSF are reported between April and September. Rickettsia rickettsii are the causative organism of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. These are obligate intracellular gram-negative coxobacilli that use ticks as their primary vector for mode of transmission. The ticks most commonly carrying Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever are Dermacenter variabilis and Dermacenter andersoni, the American dog tick and mountain wood tick, respectively. Humans are considered an accidental host in the natural life cycle. The definitive host would be canines or any other warm-blooded wild mammal. When a tick infected with the rickettsia initiate a blood meal on a host, whether it's a canine or a human, the rickettsia organisms enter that host through the salivary gland of the tick during its meal. These rickettsia will then preferentially invade vascular endothelial cells, thereby exposing the subendothelium and leading to microhemorrhage. The vast array of symptoms seen in Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever are a reflection of the systemic vasculitis caused by this subendothelial microhemorrhage. A patient infected with Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever will often present to a provider with vague and nonspecific complaints, such as fever, headache, myalgias, and GI symptoms. The fever, however, is found in 99% of cases, and oftentimes is over 102 degrees Fahrenheit. This fever usually occurs in the first two to three days of the illness and may precede other symptoms by as much as one week. The rash usually appears on the third or fourth febrile day, but sometimes can be delayed and in 4 to 16 percent of cases may be absent. The rash starts as 1 to 5 millimeter discrete macules that blanch and over several days evolves to maculopapular distribution, becoming deeper red, then becoming petechial and no longer fading when pressure is applied. They appear first on the wrists, ankles, and palms, then spread inward, often but not always sparing the face. These patients also may demonstrate what is called the rumple lead sign. This is the development of petechiae distal to a blood pressure cuff that is inflated for five minutes. This notes a generalized condition of capillary fragility and is not specific for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, as it can be seen in other conditions causing capillary fragility, such as dengue fever. The following is a table of symptoms seen in Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and how frequently those symptoms were observed in a group of 250 patients presenting with the disease, as reported in the Journal of Infectious Disease in 1984. As you can see, the most common symptoms highlighted in red are fever, rash, myalgias, and headaches. 88% of patients infected with this disease will have a rash, usually maculopapular, however some rashes will only present as petechiae. In addition to these more common symptoms of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, less 
common but more severe manifestations include CNS, such as meningoencephalitis, seizures, stupor, or coma, cardiovascular manifestations, such as myocarditis and myocardial vasculitis, AV block, dysrhythmias, or left ventricular dysfunction, and pulmonary manifestations, such as pneumonitis from microvascular leakage of fluid into alveolar space and interstitium. The differential diagnosis of Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is listed below. This is by no means a complete list. At the top of the list, to evaluate for and rule out, is bacterial meningitis with strep pneumoniae or meningococcus. Toxic shock syndrome, or measles, can also present in a similar fashion. This is also the case for infectious mononucleosis with the Epstein-Barr virus. When a patient presents with a chief complaint of nonspecific symptoms and a history of a tick exposure, it is prudent to consider other tick-borne illnesses, such as ehrlichiosis, Q fever, and tularemia. Syphilis has often been called the great pretender in medicine. And when a patient presents with a rash and nonspecific symptoms, and there is question of a sexual history, then it is reasonable to consider secondary syphilis as a diagnosis. Also, in the early stages of this rash, a primarily hematologic condition such as ITP, TTP, or HSP may actually be the case. While serological testing is available to detect the rickettsia organism and Rocky Mountain Spot and Fever infection, on the initial presentation this is a clinical diagnosis. The reason is due to a significant delay in laboratory confirmation. Indirect immunofluorescence assay is the gold standard for this infection with a 94% sensitivity. However, it requires a convalescent serum obtained at least four to six weeks after the acute phase of infection. The test then compares antibody titers from the initial phase to the convalescent phase. The problem is that if you delay treatment until the convalescent serum is available, the patient could experience significant morbidity in the meantime, and in severe cases, even death. The point is, do not rely on tests like this, and don't delay treatment. Alternatively, skin biopsy is available, and this can be seen as early as day three to identify the organism. However, a rash must be present, and the sensitivity is only 70%. Obtain additional laboratory studies as necessary, such as a complete blood count, coagulation studies, blood cultures, or cerebrospinal fluid studies via lumbar puncture. The accepted standard treatment for an infection with rickettsia rickettsii is oral doxycycline 100 mg twice daily for 7 to 10 days. Moderate or severe cases may warrant inpatient hospital admission with IV antibiotics. If there is a contraindication to doxycycline, such as an allergy or, as in pregnant women, you may use chloramphenicol as a second-line treatment. Again, I cannot stress the importance enough of treating suspected patients empirically and not delaying this treatment while waiting for laboratory confirmation. You must have a high suspicion in endemic areas, especially between the months of April and September. In summary, Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever is a tick-borne illness caused by the obligate intracellular parasite Rickettsia rickettsii. It has markedly seasonal epidemiology occurring only in warm months, consistent with the natural life cycle of its vector. It is endemic to the U.S., particularly the southeast, and its primary reservoir is the American dog tick, Dermacentor variabilis. The most common presentations are nonspecific, but usually include fever, rash, headache, and myalgias. It is a maculopapular rash that starts on the hands, soles, and forearms, and spreads inward. You must have a high clinical suspicion and treat empirically, not delaying treatment waiting for laboratory studies. Definitive treatment is achieved with doxycycline or chloramphenicol. Thank you. This has been another Learning in 10 review.